When I was growing up in Oklahoma, I grew up in Oklahoma as a family, we would go water skiing every weekend. So my dad was just loved his boat, and we would go to the lake, and we would spend the weekend at the lake, and we would water ski. And I was one of those, one of those young men that loved to ski on a, a single ski, a ski, they call it slalom skiing, and I would take risks, and I would go fast. And I loved to come into shore on one ski really fast so I could come up on dry land and walk out of my ski and dazzle the people that were on the side. My dad would tell me, he said, don't be so reckless, you might get yourself into trouble someday. But I didn't necessarily heed his warning, and I continued to, to do those types of things. So one weekend, we went skiing, went to the lake with a f f uh, friends of my parents, and they had a daughter about my age, her name was Linda. And one afternoon, my dad said, hey, why don't uh, we'll take you both, we'll pull you both double on the, on a, a, around the lake a couple of times. So we did that. We had a good, good time. When it was time for us to come into shore, Linda was on the inside closest to the shore, and I was on the outside. So we came around. Dad brought us around, and she let go of the rope, and she gently just uh, settled right into in some deep water. But that's not my style. My style, my style was to go all the way far away from the shore and slingshot myself across the wake so I could come up on shore and walk out on my ski because there was people watching. So I, I came across the wake. I looked down. Oops, I didn't count on Linda's ski rope right there. It was, it was a problem. And I, I was coming so fast, I didn't have a chance to adjust, so I hit that ski rope, and it flipped me around out of control, and I was pretty close to shore, and I slammed into the back of a boat that was parked on the shore, hit the back corner, the motor was up, the prop was exposed, I just missed that and smacked into the back corner, and I remember being dazed, looking around, looking at the people on the shore, and then I collapsed unconscious into the water. And now what I remember is somebody picking me up and moving me to shore, looking up and looking at faces. And then the next thing I remember is somebody picked me up and ran toward the car. Now in Oklahoma, we have these patches of stickers they're called goat heads. I have a picture of one for you to see. These are, these are painful. Once they get embedded into your skin, they don't come out, and they just kind of keep moving into the, into the skin. They're very, very painful. So what I remember is somebody picking me up and running me to the car, and there was a patch of goat heads between the shore and the car, and this person ran right through those stickers barefoot. So who would do something like that? Who would accept excruciating pain for someone else? Well, that was my father. My dad did that. So he was focused on me rather than the pain. So he gave himself unconditionally to me with unconditional love. My father was a man of good character and thought of others above himself. No matter what crazy things I did as a kid, and I did my, my share, he made himself continually, lovingly, and unconditionally for, him, for myself. He gave himself to me through those, through those moments, and he continued to move toward me in all my craziness. Well, in our passage today, we're going to learn that God, our Heavenly Father, continually and lovingly and unconditionally moves toward us as His children. We are His children because 
we've accepted his son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to open to the book of Luke, as we saw in the announcements. We'll be in chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And if you, have a, if you need a pew Bible, they're right there in front of you. And I think it was page 1048, she said. So, so one purpose. Well, you might know this passage as the prodigal son. And you might have some already preconceived ideas of what the prodigal son is all about. And so one of, the, one of the great narratives of this passage is that it, it encourages sinners, regardless of the degree of which they have degraded themselves, that, that we can come to the Father as an encouragement. It's a great lesson for us, for sure. But I do see some additional compelling emphasis in this parable. I see the character of God on demonstration. It's being demonstrated to us. It's on display as the person of the Father, the the, the great character of God being displayed for us as in the character of the Father. So we can learn from this. We can apply this to our lives. You've probably heard it said, or maybe you've said it yourself, I want to be more like Jesus. Well, here's a very direct lesson for you of what it looks like. So I have four observations of the Father's response in this passage. Number one, the Father's response to rejection. Number two, the Father's response to repentance. Number three, the Father's response to renewal. And number four, the father's uh, response to resistance. So uh, my key point from our passage this morning is this. Our father, our heavenly father, is ready and willing to lovingly respond to our selfish human nature. Let me say that again. Our Heavenly Father is ready and willing to lovingly respond to our selfish human nature. All right, so you can already tell four points, a key point. What does that sound like? That sounds like Brian, right? So he has, he has led me to this point with his great instruction. To understand this parable, a parable of the prodigal son, we need to really start at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. So if you'd like to just turn there, and we can read the first two verses together, I think that would uh, give us some context. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling, grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So all of chapter 15, the rest of chapter 15, is a response from Jesus to the accusations of the Pharisees and the the scribes because he, Jesus, connected with sinners. The tax collectors and the sinners, they came near to Jesus and really wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. So Jesus was making relational space for them. He was making relational space for them. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were very offended by Jesus' actions. Why? Because the religious leaders would never lower themselves to connect with sinners. So, so, So chapter 15 is geared toward heart transformation. The prodigal son is spoken to individuals that have pride and who harbor selfishness and selfish desires in their hearts. And they miss the glory of God's invitation of salvation. Jesus is explaining what really happens when we we welcome everyone into a relationship with him. 
The prodigal son is a story of three things. The misery of lostness, the nature of repentance, and the lavish enthusiasm and love that the father has for all of humanity. See, the word prodigal means extravagant. And that really sets the stone for the whole, sets the tone for the whole story. So let's start with our first character observation of God, the Father's response to rejection. So let's read verses 11 through 19 together, if you will. 11 through 19. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many, year, not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine rose in the country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one would give him anything. But he came to himself and said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So Jesus is describing a young man that couldn't wait to leave home. He made a very selfish demand of his father. The son asks for his share of the estate, which would have been about well, half of what his older brother would receive. In other words, there would be one-third for the younger brother and two-thirds for the older brother. De Deuteronomy 21.17 says this. I'm going to read it to you, 2117. 20, but he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength, the right of the firstborn. So the firstborn definitely did have the majority of, in, of the inheritance, but the younger son also had a good portion. He had a third. So normally the, the inheritance would be divided up at the point where the father died. So it was a very unloving request for the younger son to go ahead and, and ask for his father for his inheritance. It was an implication. He was implying, said, Dad, you are, to me, you are dead. It was a very deplorable request by the son towards the father. So instead of rebuking the son, which the father had probably every right to do that, he patiently and lovingly responds. So how did the father do that? It, you know, the, the wealth of this man was wrapped up in his livestock, in his property, and his servants, and his buildings, he did not have any liquid assets to be able to just hand over. He couldn't go to the ATM and pull out one-third of his investment. He had to then sell off the property. This really shows the character of the father, being humble and loving, toward his sons. And most likely to sell off his property, he meant he had to sell it to neighbors and people in around who were also looking at the father and seeing how the father would respond. See, God allows sinners to go the way of selfishness. It is often the root of individual sin. 
We all possess this selfish ambition that separates us from, uh, from God. And the prodigal son learned the hard way by his selfish desires because it led him to a life of dissatisfaction, disappointment, and separation from his father. He also learned that one of the most valuable things in life is something that money cannot buy, the loving relationships with other people. The father's response is an inconceivable expression of patience and love in the face of rejection. It's an outpouring of God's strong character toward his children, no matter how inappropriate we might respond or how we might act. So my father often told me, don't, don't be such a careless young man. Don't show off. Hold back, especially in the front of others. So my pride led me to a crisis. This could have, that, that crisis could have ended my life, which it didn't. Good for you, because Brian is here. <laughs> Just as the prodigal son's father treated his son, my dad stayed true to me, and he allowed me to make my own decisions. So we, we all learn through troubled experiences how much we need our Heavenly Father. He wants us to draw, He wants to draw near to us and establish a relationship. The tension of self decisions often leads to a longing for God and for Him to ask, and for us to then ask for His forgiveness. Once we turn around from our sinful behavior, which is called repentance, we can find ourselves being received by God continually, lovingly, and unconditionally. He is there for us without judgment. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like this? Or maybe, maybe you're in a situation currently that's very similar. So to deal with these questions, it moves us to our second character observation, the father's response to repentance. So let's look at how the son repents and how he heads home to approach his father. We will see a loving father waiting for his son and how the father responds. So together, let's read verses 20 through 21. And he, the son, arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father, uh, 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 his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. See, when the son returns home, he finds more than he could bargain for. He realizes that there's no place like home. You've heard that. There's no place like home. Here's the scene. The son is walking down the road toward home. He's dressed in rags. He probably has the odor of pigs all over him. And, and the, probably there wasn't a shower for him to get cleaned up before he comes home. So he was definitely covered in filth and had the odor that was distaste. Just, it, would just, it, was just, it was bad. And here he comes because he was feeding pigs. Leviticus, in the, in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, it says this. And the pig because it parts the hoof and is uncloven and it's cloven footed and is cloven footed but does not chew his cud is unclean for you so he, this is a statement to the jewish uh, ancient jewish culture there that pigs were forbidden for the jewish individuals to 
to eat or even to, to deal with. So pork was forbidden for the Jewish culture to eat. So not only did he lower himself to work with livestock, he lowered himself and was working with pigs, the lowest of the low. So here he comes. He's walking home, right? And he's, he's, he's rehearsing what he's going to say to the father. And if, if it was me, I'd probably be walking home and my head would be down. I would be, I would be so humbly uh, afraid to go see my father because I, all the money that he gave me that he had to sell off, I wasted away. So here I come. I'm in such a... A, a, a bad place. I'm probably walking down, face down, not really wanting to look at the father and rehearsing, oh, I'm going to say these things when I see dad. But the father sees him. And because he has compassion, the dad looks, overlooks all the hurtful things that his son did when he asked for inheritance and then he spent it all. The father forgets the heartbroken days he experienced while his son was away. All the father cares about is his son is home. His son is home. The son is, is humbly ready to ask for forgiveness. Dad, I'm so sorry. But the father doesn't allow him to even speak to unveil his plan. The father's strong character allows him to see beyond the son's current state of affairs, and he runs toward him. No matter how pleased he was to see the son again, no dignified, respecting, Middle Eastern man, father, would disgrace himself by running. Running was seen as a very undignified action for a man of his stature. Women would run, children would run, even teenage boys would run. But grown men would never run. They have this garment. He probably had to pick up his garment and run. The father's strong character demonstrates that he cares more about the welfare of his son than the opinion of others. Remember our key point? Our heavenly father is ready and willing to lovingly respond to our selfish nature. We see the father responding to the, to the son's rejection and repentance with two prevalent character traits, humility and forgiveness. First, humility, because of his willingness to give his son his inheritance and allowing himself to run to greet his father. The second character trait is forgiveness, because he welcomed his son home without any question or concern. See, the, the father's strong character moves him to receive and to reinstate his younger son. The younger son is now a renewed member of the family. So this brings us to our third character observation, the father's response to renewal. Let's read verses 22 through 24 together, we will see that the father continues to direct the scene of celebration because of the return of his son. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So the son returns home with a prepared speech for his father, but the father interrupts him and declares all 
is forgiven. The father's statements prove that all is well between him and his son. The son stands in rags of his sins and the smell, and he doesn't look or smell anything like a child of this father. But what does the father do? The father orders the best robe to be brought and wrapped around his son. The robe would cover all the stains and the dirt of the pig pen and serve to erase all the visible signs of the boy's sinful and painful past. After the robe came the ring. The ring was a symbol of sonship, authority, and and it gave the son the ability to speak as an ambassador to the father. Then Then the father calls for shoes to be brought and put on the son's feet. Only slaves were barefoot in this time. So the father looked at him after he put all this around him and on him, and he said, this is my son. This is my son. The father alone determines the position and the worth of his children. Let me say that again. The father alone determines the position and the worth of his children. So here's the main point of our parable. When a sinner comes to the father, he or she is welcomed with open arms and receives the robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61.10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. See, this righteousness is not a righteousness of good works or human goodness. No. No. This is a very righteousness. This is a very righteousness of Jesus Christ working. In our lives. This is the righteousness of Jesus that is imputed or attributed to those who have received him by faith. Philippians 3:9 says this. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. When we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, all the pain, all the stain of our sins is forever washed away. Can you believe that? When we enter into a relationship with Jesus, it is that it is though we have we were never gone from home at all. Left to our own selfish desires, we resist allowing anyone to decide our path in life. Right? We humbly come into a relationship with Jesus, then we set aside all of our res- resistance, if you will that we harbor, which really keeps us separated from a relationship with God. This brings us to our fourth observation, the Father's response to resistance. Let's read together verses 25 through 32. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back and sound, safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. 
When this son of yours came, he has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for, your, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and was found. So the celebration begins. The father invites the servants, the neighbors, probably some of the same neighbors that purchased some of the land around him when he gave his son the inheritance, and they began to celebrate, great celebration. As everyone is gathering together, the older brother is still working in the field, and he is furious about his brother's return. So what does the father do? The father moves toward him, goes out and invites him in. Please come in and participate in our celebration. So all of a sudden, we start to see the real heart condition of the older brother. And it was the same as the younger brother. They were both lost in their selfish heart. He is thinking to himself, my portion of the inheritance is now being spent on my younger brother. So the, the, the selfishness of the older brother is now being exposed. He's lost in his morality of work. See, verse 29 goes even deeper into his lostness when he insults his father. We read, it says, look, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command. You never gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends. So we read that passage, and we, can, we understand the term. But I really think this is really what the older son is saying to his father. Look, Dad, I've worked hard for you all these years, and now you're spending my money on your younger son. See, the meat was a delicacy. The fact is that the cattles were scarce and expensive. Goats were common and much less of value. So the older son adds insult upon insult to his father. His lost heart is screaming toward his father. See, once you kill a cow, a fattened calf to say the least, you have to eat it all. Right? They didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have a walk-in cooler or anything that they could keep that, that meat. So they had to eat it all. It was a big deal. This was a, the most extravagant, most extra extravagant celebration you could have. The older son is thinking, the calf that you killed is really mine. How dare you use my inheritance to feed your son? He's saying to the father, I have, a, I have obeyed you all of these years. I'm still working in the fields right now. And I, and, and, and I have the right to everything that you own. It's mine. See, he's blind in his sin. He probably never did anything to violate his father's trust until now. He was lost in his morality and his work. He may have lived in his father's house all of his years, worked in his fields, but he was never loved. He never loved his father like he should have. He may have been home, but he was in a far-off country in his heart, just like his younger brother. He was separated from God. He was lost. Let's re review our key point one more time. Our Heavenly Father is ready and willing to lovingly respond to our selfish human nature. So earlier we saw that the Father displayed good character of humility and forgiveness. And now we see the Father responding to renewal and resistance with two additional character traits. The third character trait is courage. The Father exhibits mental fortitude to carry out his decisions 
to reinstate the son despite any opposition. He stays true to his heart. And the fourth character trait is perseverance. The father intentionally moves toward the older son in the face of rejection. So the father moves toward all of us, right? Our relationship with him depends on how we respond to his invitation to be in a relationship with him. You see, Jesus is creating a relational space for all of us, all of us. See, the, 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 the character of God is on full display in this parable in the prodigal son. We are all lost in our, sin, in our sins somewhere along this spectrum of self-discovery, lost in my sin of self-discovery. If I say, I will work hard and conform and follow the rules, who does do that, right? Follow the rules, so I'm lost then in my moral conformity. I suggest that all of us, all of us, everyone in this room is lost somewhere in our selfishness. The character of our Heavenly Father is consistent and true and declares that everyone is lost if we don't have a relationship with Jesus. The world says, do what you think is best and make your own decisions and develop your own worldview void of God. You can find your way home on your own. But Jesus is telling us that the dividing point is not only in the division of self-discovery or, or morality. The true distinction is the division which is between humility and pride. Only, know, only those who know they are lost can be found. We can learn of who Christ is in his role of the Father as the head of those who have accepted his gospel. So he's the only one that makes it possible for our resurrection, our spiritual rebirth and physical salvation. Just as a younger son came to the Father and was welcomed into the family, we approach Jesus to be welcomed into the family of God. See, Jesus gives us a father like no other father. He willingly received the agony of rejected love. He was rejected, he was punished, he was crucified to bring humanity into a relationship with himself. Who would do this? Who would do this? As my father did it for me, Jesus did this for us. Jesus continually and lovingly and unconditionally loves us and moves towards us and invites us into a relationship with himself. He desires to move, for us to move toward him as he moves toward us. You remember my story of my accident? I asked the question, who would knowingly and humbly accept such excruciating pain for someone else? Jesus did. He died for you. He died for me. And he died for all of humanity. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you in humility and ask you to examine our hearts today. Show me anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any selfishness or pride or any unconfessed sin that may be hindering my relationship with you. 
I know that we are your beloved children. Having received you into our hearts and lives and having accepted your death as penalty for our sinfulness. The price you paid covered us for all time. And our desire is to live for you and with you for eternity. Amen.